That's not how I'd put it. Um, so I am going to talk a little bit about the TPP later on. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's interesting because, like, I... I, uh, I subscribe to a lot of like trial lawyer blogs and email lists and things like that. And uh, and before he took office, they were like, oh, we're finally going to have a patent holder in the White House. This is great news for us, which is interesting. Um, I mean, well, it's hard to say. He didn't exactly campaign on being a patent holder. And so uh, I, don't, I don't feel like we've been promised so much in the way of patent reform. Um, and then I'm also not certain, I mean, you know, politicians and promises, even if there were an implied promise, I don't know that, like, I wouldn't hold my breath for that to come in. Um, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, and we'll talk about the, the TPP a little bit later, like I said. Um, it's, yeah, that's, it's a little bit, it's kind of like bigger than that. But yeah, I mean, if you know something I don't about what the current administration is going to do with patents, I'd love to hear it. Um, but yeah, mostly what, I mean, people have been speculating. There's been a lot of speculating. So, Well, um, I think we can go ag ahead and get started with the official part. <laughs> um, so my name is Deb Nicholson. I'm going to talk about patents, um, global policy trends. So this is sort of like a high-level um, thing. I work at the Open Invention Network. We run a defensive patent pool that people can use to protect like Linux, GNU, Android stuff, um, anywhere in the world. So uh, that's kind of where I'm coming from. But then uh, sort of looking, at, like I said, I, I subscribe to a lot of these blogs and uh, an email list where I get news about what's going on around the world with regards to patents and in particular with regards to software patents. So I'm going to try and give you guys like a high level around the world situation. Oh, whoops, that's not how that works. Ah, okay. Um, this is how I can be contacted. I am not a lawyer. Uh, so that, of course, means this isn't legal advice. Uh, that should go without saying, and yet, like, occasionally I'll talk on this topic and someone will ask me, like, a question, like, a really specific question about their friend's company and what they should do with regards to, like, some particular legal topic. Um, even if I did decide just to be mean to tell you what you should do, you should not take my off-the-cuff, like, fake legal advice or whatever. So this is, like, kind of more uh, educational. Are there lawyers in the room? None. Interesting. Okay. So I'm going to cover first, like, why it's kind of messy. Then we're going to kind of go around the world, and then we're going to look at kind of the different categories of policy options. So... Um, Software is messy. Software is covered by both copyrights and patents because it is written. Uh, we talk about writing code. But also, software performs a function, which is generally what is covered by patents. So that makes it really kind of confusing. So copyright just to, uh, you know, was originally for things like books, writings, papers, poems, songs, um, maps even. And uh, then as we get into the modern era, we're going, this is a 10 cent tour here. Um, you know, stuff like computer code, but also like scripts for films, um, different kinds of things that we don't generally think of as being written. So like, you know, for a enforcement perspective, it means like, oh, you can just do like a cut and paste and then compare the two things and you're like, yes, you definitely copied my thing. So copyright's a little bit, more cut and dried with regards to enforcement. What gets a little messy is exactly what it applies to. Um, patents are totally a different situation. They're uh, generally <coughs> intended to be used for items that have a function. And so an early patent was for uh, the little ball on the end of the pin, which like, if you imagine using a pin without the ball on the end, I'm sure like this is probably a pretty exciting invention. Like, oh, finally, like no more holes in my thumb. Um, and, but it's also really clear, like if you put a pin with a ball on the end of it next to a pin without a ball on the end of it, it's very clear what the invention is. Like you look at it and you're like, the ball is right there. So if someone else is like, oh, I also am making pins with little globes on the end, and it's like, yeah, that's the exact same thing. So from an enforcement perspective, it's really easy to figure when someone is using your patent when it's a physical device. Uh, it got a little bit messier. Later, we decided, like, oh, pharmaceuticals, those are chemicals. You can't see them, but you can measure their effect in the world. So 
we could patent those and then are all these pills the same pill or are they all different pills? We don't really know. Um, it's, and on top of that, it's not that difficult to change the non-active part of a chemical to, uh, you know, just to make it look different from a chemical perspective, but still have the same exact impact. So keeping in mind that patents are supposed to be on the function, then you're looking at the molecule. The molecule is different, but the function's the same. Should you still get a patent on the new one with the different molecule or not? So it gets a little, like, it just keeps getting messier and messier. And then finally, we decided that it would be okay to give people patents on business methods or, uh, you know, like ideas for improving the way that they do business. So things like, like, oh, this process. So like, uh, do people remember hearing about the single click uh, patent that Amazon did? Yeah, it was, and, and so I, everyone's like, single click, clicking's not patentable, that's dumb. And they're like, oh no, it was about the customer experience. And it's like, okay. Uh, I guess it's pretty theoretical like other people are using one click or they're using one click twice in rapid succession which is actually kind of how the one click worked on Amazon anyway <laughs> but like because you had to click and say put in the cart and then click and be like do you want to buy this with one click and I'm like I already clicked once so then this is the second click but like all right whatever which is kind of like everybody else's website so it's really hard to say oh were you infringing on that patent like how many clicks is too many clicks and when do you start counting the clicks a little different and then again we were like computer code like because computer code you can think of something and then solve it with computer code so you think of a problem you're like oh you know um, people eat too much cheese I'm gonna like solve that with software and it's like well what's the code gonna look like it's like no 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 that's the whole patent I'm just gonna solve it with software uh, for the record I don't think there's anything that's too much cheese but um, it makes it uh, really messy because so, I mean, you can't read this code. I guess it's something about WordPress. But um, I might write a function that takes values from a database and uses it to populate a website. Do you know what programming language I'm using to do that? SQL. Maybe. I might be. But I don't have to be. So I could be using Python. I could be using Perl. I could be using JavaScript. I'm not sure why I would use it for that kind of heavy lifting. But, you know, it, it could be anything. Um, just for fun, I could decide, like, I'm old school, I wanted to do it with Fortran. Uh, maybe not the best idea, but I could. And it would be the same function, if not the same text. So the patent that you take out on taking stuff from a database and using it to populate a website is the same, regardless of what code you're writing it in. So the f then you're looking like, oh, here's your code, and here's my code. They look totally different, but they are performing the same function. So figuring out when you're infringing on somebody else's patent when it's expressed in software code is very difficult. So that makes it messy. It produces this whole kind of uh, uncertainty to the mix. Like if you're like, okay, I, I, I hate breaking the rules. I don't want to infringe on anybody's patents. So I will just never, I'll just never infringe on anyone's patents. You can't even do that if you want to. So, so that's, that's the problem. So it's not like this everywhere exactly. So the different countries around the world have different ideas about what should be in the patentable area of inventions. And so we're going to go through a couple of those. Here in the, in the US and North America, we have, it's, it's, we, we've been having this like kind of ongoing conversation about what the scope of patentability is. So in 2014, there was a case, uh, Alice versus CLS Bank, which went to the Supreme Court. And that was, up until that point, like I, you could do the thing where you said, I found this problem, and then I'm going to fix it using software on a computer. And the patent office is like, oh, okay, that's the solution. That's, like, you showed us your work, you're going to write software. We're, <coughs> what kind of software? I don't know. Um, that created a lot of, like, uncertainty and mess and uh, confusion as far as, like, when you were infringing on somebody else's patent. There was a lot of outcry about that. So the U.S. Supreme Court finally said, like, okay, you can't just have a solution that would otherwise not be patentable and then throw it on a computer and then say now it gets a patent because it's on a computer. So there's no more whatever non-novel, non-innovative stuff comma on a computer. You can't have a patent for that anymore. Uh, the Alice versus CLS Bank case was a business method patent, and it was um, 
the way that worked, it was like, it looked like escrow. It was like party A and party B have a business relationship, but they don't entirely trust each other. So they asked party C to hang on to the money and verify the transactions happened. It's probably been happening for like thousands of years, right? Uh, but the difference was they were saying, now we're doing it on a computer. And the Supreme Court said, yeah, asking a third guy to hold the money is not really a novel thing, even if you're now doing it on a computer. You can't have a patent for that. So that threw a lot of other patents into a question, like, are these things still patentable? And then there was a lot of pushback. Like I said, these trial lawyer blogs, like, so much hand-wringing, so much eloquent, like, flowery, <laughs> like, footnoted hand-wringing. You know, like the, the sky is falling kind of situation. Like, you know, like we won't be able to innovate anything at all. Like if, if, we, if we don't protect the patent system, like, you know, basically it's going to be like a Mad Max movie and we're, you know, the armadillo in the road. And I was like, really? That seems, I mean, and this was 2014, this case happened. You guys may have noticed people are still writing code and inventing things. <laughs> um, even here in the U.S. where we've completely tossed over our patent system. So there's been some pushback. There have been some cases that have eaten away a little bit of the clarity of that Alice decision. So we're in the middle of this conversation. <coughs> but it's not all about us. <laughs> there are a lot of other countries doing a lot of different things. Oh, we talked about that. OK. And then, huh, is that? Oh, it says made in China. <laughs> so China. Uh, took a look at what we've been doing for the last two decades as far as like patenting, patenting, patenting. A lot of Chinese companies have had to come over to the US and say like, no, we weren't infringing on that patent that we just heard of last week. Uh, they got kind of sick of that, actually. <laughs> and so um, they started patenting in China at an exponential rate. Uh, in fact, the Chinese uh, Intellectual Property Office currently receives more patent application than any other patent granting authority with 80% of their applications coming from Chinese residents. Just for uh, some perspective, the US Patent Office only grants about half of its patents to US inventors. The rest come from outside of the country, companies that want to do business and sell things to American uh, consumers. So, uh, and over the last decade or so, the Chinese patenting has become even more focused on computing and then also semiconductors, which has got a little bit of a, yeah. What? Uh, do they have similar rates of actually granting patents? So actually a little higher. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, uh, we grant about half of our patents, and they're a little bit, not a lot, but a little bit higher. Um, so so China, uh, that's that's the situation there. Uh, oh, so I had over a million patent applications were filed in China in just the first three quarters of last year. So it takes a little while to get this together. Um, Korea, Japan, and Taiwan have also been increasing their patenting, but nothing, nothing like the Chinese numbers. I mean, it's just like the volume is just not possible. But also similar trends going towards uh, a lot of computing and a lot of sem semiconductors and hardware type patents. So um, it's the the Chinese patent office is unique in scale. I mean, China's really it's big, right? It's very big. Um, so you can take a look just to see kind of patent applications by country. And this was just filed with the US Patent Office. So not only is China producing its own patents in China, they're also patenting here in the US. Um, and we think the number for the People's Republic of China is going to start doing this. It's already, if you go back like maybe like 10 years, it was like 200 patents from China to the US. And they're like, I think after being hauled over here a number of times, they were like, hey, wait a second. This thing where you file something in your country and that makes you have to, make us have to come over there and give you money, like, how do we get in on that action? So, uh, and you see, like, Japan, South Korea kind of got that message a little bit earlier. So, and this is, this is at our, uh, the US Patent Office. So, um, Europe has a slightly narrower scope of patentability for software. They're like, like, a lot of uh, US inventors and a lot of European inventors do filing in both places because they know they're going to probably be selling their things in both places. So that happens pretty often. Um, Germany might be a little bit more amenable to software patents. They have one patent office, but uh, 
it's not so different from the way it is here. Like each individual jurisdiction, the courts are just a little bit different. It's kind of more like a feudal system in that way, in that like one person's whim has a kind of a outsized impact on uh, the rules and the regulations that affect what's patentable. Um, so for instance, here in the US, like everyone goes down to the court in Texas because it's known to be like extremely friendly to patent holders. Uh, and there, uh, and when you bring cases in Europe, there are different jurisdictions that you, you kind of play against and try and figure out where you want to bring your suit. Uh, the US Patent Office, I'm sorry, not the US, the European Patent Office has also been working with the Brazilian Patent Office to make things smoother between the two of those uh, areas so that um, they're trying to get uh, Brazil looped in on the like, like file in the US, file in Europe, and then also file in Brazil. Which is interesting because Brazil used to be a little bit like, hey, we're like not about that IP stuff, man. And then they got a new president, so that's not the case anymore. So what have they done with the, with the EU? Have they co combined patent offices? No, they're not combining. They're companies? trying to make it easier to dual file. Okay. Yeah. So um, the other thing that's going on in Europe is uh, they've been having a long conversation about FRAND, which is free, reasonable, and non-discriminatory. Um, and so one of the things that uh, makes it so that you don't, you don't have to start from scratch with every single device, like one mobile phone, if, you know, it doesn't matter who, who you got it from, it still works on the same network. So there are some things that are interoperable and some things that we consider to be like standards essential. Like, so uh, if you're going to have a mobile phone, it should work with the existing mobile networks, right? And so. That can be, like, that all sounds great, like interoperability, who's not for that, right? Um, but depending on who holds the standards essential patents, it can start to look like a control over, like, oh, I would like my standard to be the standard. And so there's, like, a certain amount of lobbying and politicking that goes on deciding which patents are the standards essential patents. Additionally, if you hold the standards essential patent, your company has it, then you get to ask everyone else for a free, reasonable, and non-discriminatory fee for using your standards essential patent. Which, one European country to another, like what's reasonable isn't quite so different. Um, I mean, it's not exactly great, but it's, it's not quite so different. So, um, so they're having that discussion. There are also some people that are looking at that situation and saying, oh, that's giving the company that holds the standards essential patent basically a monopoly. So they control the platform. Like, eh, I don't know how you feel about that, right? So, uh, so they're in the middle of having this conversation of like how much, how much friend versus like how much freedom to innovate like outside of the, you know, the standard platform are we trying to, you know, trying to facilitate. Um, so that's kind of the question that they're asking there. Uh, on to Australia and New Zealand. Um, so uh, Australia has a similar scope of patentability to Europe, but not exactly. It's, um, you can see where Australia is, but they're also, it's a whole nation of English speakers. So. They do a lot of business with China, and they do a lot of business with the US. <laughs> so the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement that was under consideration was like very worrying to Australia, because it was basically everyone in the Pacific Rim except China. And they were like, we should probably sign this, because we want to be friends with the US and everybody else in the Pacific Rim, but we don't want to piss off China, because they're really big and they're right here. So it was like, you know, there was a, like a lot of ambivalence and like, could you guys like fight somewhere else and then just let me know what you decide? Because like, we don't really want to screw up our relationship with either country. Um, New Zealand uh, is funny because it's it's right next to Australia, but they have a very minimal scope of patentability. And part of that is, I mean, you can see how small New Zealand is, uh, is that they just have. Um, what the citizens there want, it's just a lot easier for them to actualize that in their political system. This is a better access, it's like smaller districts, you know, so it's like, you get like a couple hundred people together and they're like, we want this, and New Zealand's like, whoa, 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 everyone showed up, what the heck? <laughs> uh, no one's surfing today, wow, okay. Like, yeah, okay, we'll do it. Uh, no software patents, well, yeah. But New Zealand also, like, no, it's an island. They, 
they have white wine, they have oysters, but apparently that's not enough to live on. And so they also <laughs> need to do business with all these other countries. So, um, so they have currently a fairly minimal scope of patentability. If the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement or something like it were, uh, they were to sign it, they would have to harmonize their scope of patentability to come up to what the US scope of patentability is, which would be the same as the one in Australia and everybody else in the Pacific Rim. And the New Zealanders are really like, eh, we really don't want to do that. Um, I, I went over there during part of that conversation, and, and they were like, oh, and I'm like, no, sorry, way above my pay grade. I don't, I don't have any impact on the TPP. Um, so, uh, you know, so you see, like, you can already start to see that the scope of patentability that we have here in the U.S. is not exactly what everybody wants in every other country. But that doesn't stop people from trying to do that. Um, India is an entirely different situation. They don't actually grant patents for software. Uh, and there's been a lot of pushback on the, um, the FRAND, the free, reasonable, and non-discriminatory thing we talked about. So uh, there's a lot of very low dollar market offerings in the Indian smartphone space. So in India, you can actually get a smartphone for $5. Uh, would you want to sit on it and expect to make calls? Probably not, but $5 is pretty cheap. And so a free, like a reasonable fee for a $600 phone is not a reasonable fee for a $5 phone. It's not, you know, that's just how math works. Um, and so uh, they just have, it's like all open source operating systems, homegrown apps, and, and really, really cheap hardware. Um, so with that kind of a margin, I mean, there's just not much of a margin on a $5 phone. So uh, this is, um, they have a couple of other issues in that um, Indian companies, like for the hardware side, not just the software side, but for the hardware side, um, India doesn't really have a culture of patenting. So there are some hardware patents that have been issued in India, but less than 10% of them are held by people who actually live in India. So that's, that's tricky. Um, right, oh, okay. Uh, the other thing is that um, mobile devices in India are actually more ubiquitous than landlines or any other form of communication or um, transferring stuff. And so um, they use it for all kinds of stuff. They, I mean, it's even more ubiquitous than personal, uh, than like a laptop or a personal computer. So uh, people do a lot of their uh, health services on, on that, they share a lot of agricultural information, like weather reports, like information about what's going on in the market, uh, crop diseases. Um, there are a lot of apps for personal safety. So if you feel like you're in danger in India, there's like an app where you just press a button and it sends your location to like five people that you trust. Um, and so the mobile industry is, is critical in India. It's like, like India has looked at like $5 smartphones are like the best possible thing that could happen to India. So when Sony Ericsson, or I guess it's just Ericsson there, Ericsson comes in and says like we would like Indian smartphone developers to pay us a, a reasonable fee for our patents. India's like, yeah, I don't know. There's actually a, a competition commission of India and their tack is that these patents from countries outside of India that affect or threaten to destroy or wipe out the Indian homegrown smartphone industry are anti-competitive. And that under like a, a desire to not um, give a monopoly to a company outside of India, they're not gonna uphold those patents there. So Ericsson's been back there three times. And every single time they try to like, well, you know, uh, like they don't want to say like screw you, Ericsson, <laughs> exactly. Um, but and so the decisions are pretty verbose, and they have a lot of like, well, it seems like this one time, like the, you know, the procedure was a little like not quite what you thought, and so like we we ruled for the homegrown industry, again, uh, or like oh, um, we have decided that they they only oh, like maybe 2% of what you asked for, because like that was the only part where they were infringing on what you said. And so, uh, so the Competition Commission of India has kind of like in a very verbose but polite way to say, like tried to say, yeah, no, 
no, I'm sorry, we're not going to uphold your patents here. <laughs> Which is very different from like what we talked about is going on in China. China was like, cool, where do we get these patents? And India was like, yeah, no, we're, uh, yeah, maybe come back tomorrow, we talk about some more, kind of. Which is, is very interesting. Um, and there are a lot of places that haven't quite decided how to respond to the idea of globalizing the, what the scope of patentability should be. Um, oh yeah, this is about, uh, about less than 10% of the patents being held by people who actually live in India. Uh, and the Competition Commission. So, on to Africa. So, um, Africa, actually more so than China, is actually really, really big. And, but, um, and the smartphone is very important there too. Uh, a lot of US or Western based companies would like to be able to deal with just one thing when they go to Africa. Like it would make it really easy for them to be like, could you guys just do one idea about what the scope of patentability is for all of Africa? <laughs> Which we're looking at Africa, it's really big. Um, that's, They've, no, that's not going to happen. Uh, as much as as much as Western companies would just like to have like one column in their spreadsheet for Africa, it's not going to happen. Uh, Africa has two uh, IP offices. One is for English speaking parts of Africa, and one is for French speaking parts of Africa, which makes sense, right? Like you know that they would have a slightly different idea about what the scope of patentability should be. There's also um, there's also some other problems with uh, accepting a Western scope of patentability that are a little bit outside of the software perspective. So there's a lot of traditional medicine in Africa and having Western pharmaceutical companies come over and be like, oh, oh, yeah, we made a chemical version of that. Like, so that plant that you've been using for like 3,000 years and you never wrote down or filed with the patent office, um, we own that now and you should pay us royalties. And most of Africa is like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> No, that's not what's happening. So, um, so there's a, there's another layer of like suspicion for uh, you know U.S. based ideas about the scope of patentability in Africa. And so, um, as much as people might like to see that all be one uh, response to what the global scope of patentability should be, it's not going to happen. So, uh, although that doesn't mean that individual nations in Africa may not they may eventually decide that they do want to sign treaties or bilateral agreements with other nations about the scope of patentability. Um, so, yeah, so that's, that'll be very interesting. Um, so, uh, and also there, like with the, you know, uh, <coughs> the relative weight of the currency, like 2,000 essential patents is gonna be a hard sell in Africa as well. So, so each country has this idea, like, you know, they, the question before them is, are they going to harmonize? Harmonize. You should be suspicious when you hear harmonize when it is applied to global uh, trade. Or resist. And then how to resist. And how much to resist. And how, or do you have to just resist politely? That's apparently the thing we're supposed to do now, I think. Um, and then in which way? So this is when I'm going to talk about kind of the policy aspect. So harmony, if we are going to have some kind of harmonizing, uh, is it going to be a public or a private endeavor? Uh, private with public oversight, like uh, AKA standard settings organizations. So there's sort of this innate tension of um, we would like people to, like, whatever your field is, we want people to have input on how their field is governed. Like, it doesn't really make sense for government to get really micromanagey on uh, some particular field of endeavor. But if you leave them completely to their own devices, then it's kind of like leaving the cookie monster in charge of the cookie jar. So there has to be some kind of, um, of deal there. Antitrust laws are supposed to keep them from like full-on collusion and exclusion of new smaller startups, innovative ideas, and things like that. Um, but those are tricky, and uh, in invoking the antitrust thing tends to be a sort of a last resort. Uh, and legislators, they get kind of reluctant to get really micro on the way that they want to manage stuff because they know that micromanaging a specific industry is going to be expensive. And a lot of time what happens when you do that 
is that they just kind of move the goalposts. Like, okay, so don't do this anymore. And they're like, cool, we changed our business model. We're doing something over here that doesn't actually be covered. It doesn't have to be covered by this at all. You know, so it's, there's a, there's a balance. Like, you know, we do want, uh, yeah, so like a referee. Uh, so we do want interoperability. Like, it, it is a good thing to have interoperability. Um, there's a, a, oh, whoops. Um, oh, actually, I was going to say, are cat pictures a public good? Like, when we talk about interoperability on the web and the internet, like, I think they might be. This is my cat, so I'm a little biased. But, um, you know, it's, the internet isn't on cat pictures. Like, people get a lot of access to municipal information. You conduct your job searches there now. Um, you might get important health information from the from the internet. So interoperability and, and, and like having some amount of most people being ac able to access most public things is a public good, even if the cat pictures we, we get as a bonus, right? Um, this is a, a picture of a fire hydrant. So uh, I, I grew up in Maryland, and uh, Baltimore and Washington, D.C. used to have completely different fire hydrants. So they had a huge fire in Baltimore, and the Washington, D.C. trucks showed up, and they're like, we'll help. And then they couldn't connect their hoses to the hydrants. Tragic. Um, but after that, they were like, you know, we should probably standardize on this, this hose hydrant thing, because, like, yeah, that was, wow. So they had a lot of, like, uh, idle fire trucks hanging around watching buildings burn. Yeah. That happened last year? <laughs> Sorry, no, no, no. Uh, that was a while ago. That was, I think, in the 30s. Yeah, that was. <laughs> I know the wire makes it seem like Baltimore is this, like, wasteland, but it's, it's they have the internet there and buses and, you know, it, I promise, I promise. Um, yeah, so, so private with some public oversight, like, like I said, it's a balancing act of how you might uh, get both like a good amount of interoperability, but without having government take on this huge task of micromanaging an industry. Another way that you might do is semi-public. And this is kind of the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, where it's like, well, semi-public is what I'm saying. So it wasn't very transparent, right? Like, we knew it was happening, but we didn't know it was in there. Um, and is the, is the, oh, we're going to talk about balance again. But is the TPP going to come back? A lot of entities spend a lot of money to draft the TPP. I'd be really surprised if they didn't repackage it or repackage the parts they felt the most strongly about and try <coughs> to sell it again. They might have to wait three and a half years or eight years or whatever, you know. Um, but, uh, I would be very surprised if something similar to the TPP did not reappear on the on the table. Uh, again, like I said, like you'd think I like I. It's hard to not be depressed sometimes when you think about this stuff. But um, the TPP, like it, it's the problem with the multilateral uh, trade agreements is that they give this illusion of certainty. So remember, we talked about the certainty, like knowing, like oh, is my thing patentable? Is what you're doing the same as what I'm doing. Can I sue you or can you sue me? Like people want this certainty. And the, the multilateral trade agreements seem to offer that. Like, oh, we'll just make it the same everywhere and then you'll always know what's going on. Like it'll always be patentable, whatever it is. Or um, that kind of thing. But it can easily sort of come into this like out of date entrenched norm where like the scope of patentability especially for something like software or technology that's moving really quickly, it changes. And so the scope of patentability that works for us today, even if you take the light that what we have works, uh, may not work tomorrow, or may work even less well, or may, you know. So, uh, so we have the certainty, but it also, it also sort of, uh, because of the players at the table when we draft that agreement, it benefits the, the big players that are at the table today. And so it continues to reinforce the current imbalance of power. So trade agreements, the biggest, the biggest entity at the table is gonna have the biggest say in what's in it. And that means that a, like entrenching a specific norm tied to today's ideas of technology and what the marketplace is like 
it's going to continue to perpetuate that exact imbalance of power. Like, is that, I don't think that's a good thing. I think, um, I don't think that promotes innovation. Um, and, and it also isn't real great for the idea of local sovereignty. Like the example we talked about with the $5 smartphones in India, they need them. That, it's, it's very different there. I mean, like, you know, there are probably folks here that would love a $5 smartphone, but it, it's sort of the whole country there. So um, it's a big deal. So our third option would be a completely public response. So like AKA like a legislative response. So not like semi-public, behind closed doors, no transparency, we don't get to read the legislation, and not um, mostly private but with a little bit of public oversight. A public, like fully public <coughs> response, we could, we might see more antitrust regulations. This would make more work for government because they would have to enforce those antitrust regulations and we talked about how that could be a little bit tricky. Um, but uh, we might start to see other places around the world come up with something like the Indian Competition Commission, anti, you know, Competition Commission that um, enforces antitrust regulations to the benefit of their homegrown industries. Um, or we might see more efforts like the New Zealand uh, legislation that uh, limited the scope of patentability to exclude software patents. So, um, right, so there. Uh, so the thing is, what, we, like, what people want is they want certainty. And the more you look at this and the more you kind of get into it, the more you see that certainty would mean like the technology can't change. Uh, it would also mean that we can't have any more legislation that makes the situation different. Um, and it would mean that we'd have to say to judges they have to stop making case law that impacts the scope of patentability or the, you know, the results that you expect to get when you go to court. All of those things I think are really important like for democracy but also just for the innovation and, and having like a, I don't know, like a non-static society. So, there's a lot of factors, there's a lot of balls in the air. So I think we're not gonna get certainty anytime soon, um, as much as people might want it. It definitely, like when you do spreadsheets, it's really nice to just copy and paste each year's thing and have it be the same, but yeah, sorry. Um, if you do wanna read more about this, because uh, that, was, that was pretty high level on a lot of stuff, like we did the whole globe, except for like Antarctica, and like, you know, the Ukraine. But, um, so putting China's patent rise into context, if you want to read all about the Chinese stuff, that's right there. If you want to read more about the patents and mobile devices in India, there's a whole paper on that. Mm -hmm. um, and, the, uh, and then a second paper, like specifically looking at the French cases. And then, uh, where did that one? Oh, yeah. And then this is like looking at France, like kind of um, around uh, between the US and Europe. So there's a lot, there's, and I just, I didn't want to overwhelm you guys, but um, there's a lot of other reading that you could do about this, uh, whole nations, whole categories of papers on this stuff, if you want. Um, but hopefully this was interesting so you can kind of see the broad strokes of what's going on. I work on legal issues, so of course I have picture credits. Um, and then I would be happy to take your questions on this topic and I'll answer them to the best of my ability. Thank you. Um, I would say New Zealand is probably the most uh, liberal scope of patentability and the U.S. is probably the most restrictive. Uh, is, the, is the, like, the U.S. patents the most things and New Zealand pats, patents the least things. Okay. If that's the way you mean it. Yeah. Are you familiar with the uh, general data privacy regulation, the new European regulations that are coming around around data privacy? Yeah, it comes up maybe in Yeah, um, a little bit. It's, uh, that's kind of outside the scope of this, but. Oh, well, it, it is, but specifically, um, my understanding is that there's some, uh, the data processors now have to tell people how they're processing their data. Yeah. And I was wondering uh, if there was an expectation around um, a lot of IP. Oh, as far as harmonizing that yeah. stuff? <sighs> yeah. Yeah. Kind of related, right? I'm sorry, it's a bit of a tangent. Yeah, no, no, no. I know what you mean. It's. Uh, it sounded like a lot of job security. 
<laughs> yeah, and I gotta say that's something they're really good at. Um, yeah, it's uh, without certainty. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I know it's right up there with like cop or funeral director, right? Um, or it's gotten to be. Uh, yeah, I mean that is, hmm, that is like a whole other thing. Um, in that, uh, well. The situation is a little different. So, like, people write software all over the place, but a lot of those, like, multinational social networks that people use are based in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And then the entity in our government that wants to have, like, a backdoor, as if they're, like, a secure backdoor, if there were such a thing, which is a complete lie. But um, if they're, like, wants to have that thing is the NSA here in the U.S. Sure. So it's it's very much, like, you know, uh, Europe can do whatever they want. Like, they're not, you know, sure. uh, beholden to our... Th it's not the same as trade, right? right. Um, whereas, like, oh, we want to be able to sell you our things and you sell us your things. Social media, like, I mean, advertisers pay for it, but the people using it don't pay for it. So like, right. it's not like European users are paying to use Facebook or... Involved. Right, so it's it's comes under a completely different kind of situation. So, like, so U.S. can just be like... Hey, do you mind like uh, leaving the back doors in for so like we can spy on your citizens too? And you could be like, <laughs> no. And there's and we don't have any leverage in that way because it's not a trade negotiation. Okay. The, the European law has to do more with the telemetry devices sent. Right. And uh, that the user know what the telemetry is, sure. what it's being used for. Can we request that be removed and uh, has the ability to turn it off? Mm -hmm. Cool, yeah. Uh, the Qualcomm Apple dispute, is that, do you have any interest in comments on that? Qualcomm Apple, remind me which one that is. Uh, Apple's well, been to court with everyone, so. Yeah, well, <laughs> Qualcomm uh, holds industry standard patents for the phones. Oh, the file, uh, yeah. Quit paying, and now uh, Qualcomm wants to stop them from importing iPhones. Yeah. Um, they can definitely try that. And um, well, okay, so there's a couple of different things to unpack there. Like, one, uh, there's been a lot of smartphone suits, and um, and some of them are like really big, like Samsung, Apple, like um, Google, and everyone, Apple, and everyone else. Um, and uh, yeah, so they might do that. Like, if that case goes all the way through, like, it'll just be a giant transfer of money from Apple to Qualcomm, right? Um, or they could they could choose to say I mean Apple could choose to say like we won't sell our smartphones with your stuff in it anymore. Like I don't think they're gonna start so, stop selling stop selling phones so they'd have to find another vendor to get that stuff from. Qualcomm has a lot of power in that situation, so I don't think that they'll be able to replace Qualcomm stuff. But uh, the other reality of going to court is that uh, sometimes it comes down to whose lawyers are smarter and kind of better paid, right? Like, the uh, unfortunately, our judicial system uh, favors the frequent litigator that understands how these things work and understands how to maneuver these things and understands the key phrases that are happening in the current litigation. And so, you know, so like the Alice case, the phrase is like on a computer. And so like there's, um, the U.S. Patent Office now conducts patent quality lunchtime webinars for its examiners so that they can take the recent court decisions and then apply those to incoming patent applications. And sometimes they're just as like, if you see on a computer, it's probably not a good patent anymore because of the Alice decision. But there's a whole lot of language like that employed on both sides. Like, you know, if um, understanding what that current sort of state of the scope of patentability is or what kinds of keywords to use um, is its own whole sort of expertise. So so lawyers understand they're like, oh, so you know, I'm not I'm not saying this is a 101, like that stuff so last decade. I'm saying this is a 102. And it's like, oh, very astute counselor. You know, so it's like it, it's a weird kind of game. Um, and the courts uh, the court's willingness to hear certain kinds of arguments about the scope of patentability um, or like who's infringing on what has evolved over time. It used to be that um, the courts here in the U.S. were really reluctant to throw the patent office under the bus and say like, 
You gave them a patent for that? Are you kidding me? That's changed over the last decade. Now they're just like, oh, you guys. And, and they will say, like, we're tossing this patent out because basically the patent office didn't do their job and issued a patent they shouldn't have. So it's a constantly evolving process. Um, so um, who knows? There's a lot of factors, so it could come down either way. Yeah, I, I just did a very long lawyerly, like, it depends. Sorry. <laughs> uh, other questions on uh, any of this stuff? Yeah, in the back. Um, one slide said 2000 essential patents, and it, it looked like there was something you mentioned before, but I don't remember it. Oh, yeah. So many smartphones could, could be considered to have up to 2000 standards essential patents. Like each individual device, like the, the swipe, the shape, the input for the text, the, um, all the things in the operating system, the way the clock works, like any and all of those things have patents on them. So, but they're not all the same. Okay. No, no, they're all different. They're all like, they've spliced the <coughs> mobile phone down into like 2,000 plus functions that are each patentable. Yeah. How much of that $600 <laughs> well, if you look at India where they've decided they don't care about, I mean, maybe add another 10 bucks for actually getting a nice case and, yeah, could be. <laughs> yeah. Oh, don't forget, you're also paying um, Microsoft royalties here in the U.S. too, because they have patents on all this stuff even though they couldn't get people to buy their phones. Legal fees, yes. Yeah. Over here. How well do those work on the, on the international stage? I right. American patent pools, what about other countries? Uh, so there aren't, uh, well, there are paid patent pools, but the Open Invention Network, where I work, is the only uh, defensive patent pool that applies to Linux and Android and GNU and stuff. And so uh, there isn't really another thing to compare it to. But your question about how effective is it is um, sort of about 2,200 companies that have all agreed not to sue each other. We can't affect anyone who hasn't signed. They can still sue, but they have a cross license to every patent in the pool. So then once they're sued, they can counter sue. If they get sued by someone outside of the pool, they can counter sue. And they, use, they get to use like IBM's whole portfolio, Red Hat's whole portfolio, Google's whole portfolio, Canonical's whole portfolio on Linux and GNU and Android, which is pretty big. So a lot of our members, I think don't get sued very much by practicing entities outside the pool. You notice I said practicing entities. Uh, you can't counter sue a company that doesn't do anything. So a non-practicing entity, or more commonly known as a troll, you can't counter sue a troll because the nature of a patent suit says, I see you using my patent, you have to stop or give me money. But trolls aren't using anyone's patents because they aren't doing anything. So. It is of limited utility for that particular situation because you can't counter sue a troll. Um, uh, my friend Robinson, is he still in here? Yes, okay. Um, works on that issue of like, how do trolls get so many patents? Are you gonna talk tomorrow, what time? Uh, 10.45, I think. 10.45 tomorrow if you wanna hear more about the troll side of the solution, to like the community solution to the troll problem. Um, but yeah, uh, so, the thing, I don't think that our pool would be effective if it was not international. Everyone sells all their stuff back and forth across different uh, national lines. Um, the phone itself already has like stuff from several different countries already in it. Um, anywhere that there are customers, you can bring a patent suit. <laughs> if that's your jam. Um, but uh, yeah, and so, the goal for us is to constantly increase the patent pool such that, um, you know, uh, there's nobody interesting or, or important left outside the pool. So, can I see another hand or anything else? I think, what are we, how are we on time? Yeah, we have some time. Um, oh, whoops. Oops. Um, cool. All right. Everyone's like, yay, I feel great about the world. That's awesome.
Um, it's okay. I mean, the point in telling you about all these things is so that you know. <laughs> and then if we get another weird um, multilateral trade agreement that is threatens to sort of lock us in on the IP stuff, there's a lot in there. I don't want to get into everything in there. Um, we can push for something um, more uh, oriented towards local control. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, but so one of the responses that you've heard about is that China might create a China-centric CPP. Um, yeah. Given the, given their strength and their rapid growth in patent stuff. Yeah. How will that affect? Uh, That'd be amazingly interesting. Um, yeah, they could. I mean, uh, it would be like everyone but the U.S. Right? That's kind of what we were doing with ours. Right. It's interesting. I feel like it's sort of like China's like, Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. Mm -hmm. And then like pick up our stuff and get there a couple years later. And uh, But uh, there's nothing stopping them. And I mean, the US can be a bit of a bully in international trade stuff. So, you know, they're, <laughs> and, and now we have someone who's willing to like, not like sort of obliquely threatened, but might actually just call up and be like, don't sign that thing. <laughs> uh, and then issue a lot of threats about like, you know, like, I don't know, like we won't send any more Budweiser or Britney Spears over or wh whatever it is that they get from us. It's, a, it's, it's probably beef and uh, oil, but it's, uh, uh, you know, it's, that's the leverage that you have mm -hmm. in these international trade situations is you could say like, well, we don't want to, we, we won't sell to you anymore and we know you can't get this at the price that you want it from anyone else. We don't make that many things. Like, they'll still have pants and chairs and stuff in China. Um, but, um, you yeah, know, I'll probably have a lot less beef. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. If, like, that would be, it's hard to say. There's so many factors on what, what, like, what would be in that agreement and then, like, how it would be applied and, um, and really, like, how much, like, screw you, USA, is in there. Which the TPP had, like, not a small amount of, like, screw you, China. So, mm. you know. Yeah. I don't know if that's super depressing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, there's been a, um, a movement in some cases towards, say, bringing manufacturing back to the United States or mm -hmm. centralizing it. Automation makes that possible, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, on one hand, we're becoming a much more global marketplace of stuff and goods. Um, we are, or at least could become, um, a much more um, isolated producer of high tech, um, or at least integrator of those components, mm -hmm. which could possibly escape some of the patents, especially if components have to be put together in different places. So, so that you might be only be under certain jurisdictions. Actually, put a product together. Mm -hmm. So, is that is there? Um, do you think that, that might be something? Especially, say, China's getting really patent hungry, uh, really patent happy. Is that is that is that a possible future where basically you know you see integration happening at, at a more country level, so that you build a small fab in New Zealand or something to put these things together, and thus you know basically escaping all the patent fees mm -hmm. um, that you have to do if you import and pull devices. Yeah, that's interesting. So there's there's kind of like two or three different things in there. Like one is like, what if what if we did all the bluster and then China's like, we're not sending you stuff anymore. <laughs> we had to make our own things. Um, two is like, is 3D printing technology going to get awesome enough that it's not just like plastic junk and chocolate and actually be usable stuff that is like available at a regular, like, you know, a familiar consumer price point that we would actually consider that a viable option. And then third is the question of like, how, how will IP law morph to cover the designs and products of 3D printings, uh, 3, 3D printing machines? Um, yeah, uh, would China not send us stuff? Eh, maybe, we send them a lot of money, that's possible. Um, will 3D printing technology increase without making a lot of stuff more expensive? Uh, 
uh, like I think pre 3D printing technology could uh, it'll probably be spotty. It won't look the same, right? Like some stuff will get good and cheap, and some stuff will just get good and stay expensive, and some stuff will just like not. Like maybe we'll go back to buttons instead of zippers. I don't know. Um, <laughs> And then three, like, how will the law evolve to cover that stuff? So there's, like, already some conjecture and conversations about. One of the things we love to do uh, in U.S. law is to kind of try and extrapolate how our existing law would cover new stuff. That's why we have the thing with patents and copyrights both covering software, even though uh, as they existed and as they were originally conceived, they're a really poor fit for software. Um, so, but that doesn't mean we won't do that again. We will probably try and mash our existing IP tools into like a, a shape that deals with 3D printing. Will it be as kludgy of a fit with as many growing pains as it was for software? Probably, uh, but there'll be different ones. So I, I don't know what they'll be. <laughs> um, does that yeah, add to your <laughs> uh, unanswered questions? <laughs> Um, yeah, okay. So, anything else, or go in the back I here? I know that the NSA is watching this, but do you have any information on the Russian patent law? Or what's going on right yeah, that one's interesting. It was really hard for me to find anything on the Russian patent uh, system, so I did not talk about that. But not because the NSA is listening, just because like, I couldn't find any uh, scholarship on it. Um, they do have patents, but they're... Um, there is a patent lens. There is a Russian patent office, but it's it's way it's way down um, the scope right now. That doesn't mean they won't change. Um, but yeah, they're like kind of more um, down the down the stack. I, I kind of hit the places where the patenting is the the hottest. Where will that go? Who knows? It only took China like five years to um, exponentially increase their patenting. You know so. Um, what will Russian patenting be like in five years? It could look like China, or maybe it'll look like India, where they're like, no, like, you buy Russian stuff when you're in Russia, and uh, we keep everything else out. I don't know. They could go either way. Cool. All right, well, thanks for coming and listening to all this. Thank you.